we continue our lecture on natural language processing this is lecture number 3 and we continue with the stages of natural language processing looking at the slide again reemphasizing the fact that ambiguity is the crux of the problem in natural language processing and ambiguity makes natural language processing the challenging job that it is we remind ourselves of the stages of natural language processing phonetics and phonology morphology lexical analysis syntactic analysis semantic analysis pragmatics discourse in the last lecture lecture number 2 we were discussing syntactic analysis we uh, showed this example of structural ambiguity i did not know my pda had a phone for 3 months the cameraman shot the man with the gun when he was near tendulkar this long sentence from P. G. Woodhouse and this particular uh, caption from Times of India, all of them, all of them have multiple meanings because of the ambiguity, ambiguity arising from different sources. I would like to repeat the sources of ambiguity by writing down ambiguity. of a sentence arising from one multiple meanings of words two multiple attachment points of preposition phrases. Okay. These two are the most important uh, ambiguity sources. The third reason is clause attachment points. Okay. So, multiple meanings of words, multiple attachment point of preposition phrases and multiple clause attachment points. The interaction of these three produces ambiguity of sentences, different meanings of sentences. Okay. So, we proceed further. In this slide, we are saying that higher level knowledge is needed for this ambiguity a machine will automatically produce uh, multiple parses depending on the attachment points and the clausal points. Uh, the noun that takes the preposition phrase uh, gets modified by the preposition phrase. Okay? So, this is a longer noun phrase where the head noun has gotten a modifier in the form of a preposition phrase. So, this is the preposition phrase ambiguity. The preposition phrase may be attached to the verb, where the whole phrase is like an adjunct for the verb. The other attachment ambiguity is that which comes from uh, clause attachment points. The clauses can get attached to different points in the sentence. Okay. Now, when these different kinds of ambiguity arise, how is it possible that we still understand the meaning of a sentence from the context and from the interaction of the sentence with many other sentences in the neighborhood? How does it happen? Many times it happens from what is there in the slide. Higher level knowledge is needed for disambiguation, which is where semantics comes into being. I saw the boy with a ponytail. Here, the machine, the parser will produce two parses. In one case, the attachment will be shown with boy, with a ponytail is attached to the boy. This is a modifier for the boy. In the other case, with a ponytail will be part of the verb phrase, saw the boy with a ponytail. Here, the verb C has an object in the form of the boy and with a ponytail is an adjunct for the verb. 
So, just like I saw with a telescope the boy. So, this paraphrasing would be I saw with a ponytail the boy and we immediately know that this particular sentence or this particular reading does not have any meaning. Uh, ponytail cannot be an instrument of seeing. So, this is the word knowledge which is brought to bear. So, this possibility is excluded and now we have a single parse for the sentence. I saw the boy with a ponytail means the boy has the ponytail. Next example is that we do disambiguation through pragmatics. We consider this sentence once again old men and women were taken to uh, safe locations. Now, this particular uh, sentence has two meanings. One meaning is that both men and women were old. The other meaning is only men were old. Now, old men and women were taken to safe locations. Since, women both young and old, both young and old women were likely to be taken to safe locations. Our uh, surmise or presumption would be that the word old qualifies only men, because women both young and old will be taken to safe locations. So, imagine there is an attack on a region or a country and men, women, everybody are taken to uh, safe locations. Young men of course, would go and fight the enemy. Old men will have to be taken to safe locations. Similarly, women will have to be taken to safe locations. So, the reading that we prefer is this first reading, only the men are old and this kind of consideration is known as the pragmatic consideration. Okay. Here, syntax is giving us two possibilities, semantics is also giving us two possibilities. It is not excluding the isolating the possibility of women also being old. Okay. So, up to the level of semantics ambiguity remains. There are two different parses with old, okay, with old uh, being a qualifier for both men and women. Semantics also saying that both men and women can be old. Here comes pragmatics which says that uh, both men and women being old and they being taken to safe location is less probable than the fact that only the men are old and old men and women both are being taken to the safe location. Okay. So, this is a purely it is known as a pragmatic consideration and here pragmatics is coming and disambiguating. Okay. The next example in the slide is the discourse example where other sentences are helping to disambiguate. So, we took this sentence no smoking areas allow hookahs inside. We saw that uh, this particular sentence has two meanings. One meaning is that there are special designated areas called no smoking areas. Those areas will not allow any cigarettes or cigars inside, but they will allow hookahs because you can have this artificial flavored uh, water kept inside the hookah and one can smoke that so called smoke that and enjoy the experience of hookah. So, no smoking areas they allows they allow hookahs those artificial hookahs. The other meaning is that this no is a qualifier for the whole sentence all the remaining words in the sentence. So, this would mean that uh, there is no smoking area, you will not be able to find any smoking area which allows hookahs inside. Okay. So, they allow cigarettes and cigars, but they do not allow, allow hookahs. So, just contrast this with the earlier meaning we talked about. The, in this earlier meaning, the smoking areas, uh, they did not allow cigars and cigarettes, but they allowed hookahs. The next meaning is saying that smoking areas are allowing cigars and cigarettes, but they are not allowing hookahs completely opposite meaning. Now, let us see how a particular meaning is isolated from discourse from the discourse. So, if you look at this sentence no smoking areas allow hookahs inside except the one in hotel grand. Okay. This is a discourse 
The other sentence is no smoking allows areas allow hookahs inside, but not cigars. Okay. So, we have connectives here in the form of except and but and the rest of the text helps disambiguate. Let us see how. No smoking areas allow hookahs inside. This is that other reading. You will not find any smoking area which allows hookahs inside except the one in Hotel Grand. So, this except one in Hotel Grand that is helping to disambiguate the previous sentence. No smoking area areas allow hookahs inside. So, the meaning that is conveyed by this piece of text is you will not find any smoking area which allows hookahs inside. The next sentence no smoking areas allow hookahs inside, but not sugar uh, not cigars. This is uh, the meaning where no, e, no smoking area is a sp special designated area where one cannot smoke. Okay. So, they allows they allow hookahs, but not the cigars. So, you can see how an additional piece of text coming after the sentence is helping to disambiguate. Okay. So, this is an example in this slide actually we show that even though syntax can produce multiple parses, in one case semantics will exclude one possibility, next case pragmatics will exclude a possibility and in the last case discourse other pieces of text will exclude possibilities. Proceeding further, we now come to a particular phenomenon called garden pathing. Garden pathing is really a headache for parsing and there are a special kind of sentences called garden path sentences. Let us understand what it means. Let us look at this first sentence here. The horse raced past the garden fell. Second sentence is the old man the boat. Third sentence is twin bomb strike in Baghdad kill 25. So, all the sentences have some interesting peculiarities in them. Let us look at the first sentence. The horse raced past the garden fell. This particular sentence could have been over at garden. The horse raced past the garden. What is this fell doing here? Okay. Even a human being will get a mild shock. Let us say he will get a mild he will get surprised after having processed all the words up to garden and then encountering fell. Okay. So, what, what will he think? He will think that I have processed these sentences, okay. I have processed this, these words in the sentence, I have processed the, I have processed horse, raised, passed the garden and then I encounter a fell. The sentence could very well, very well have been over at garden. Is, is there a mistake in this sentence? Is this sentence grammatically wrong? The sentence is not grammatically wrong except that after processing garden and thinking that the sentence is over here, we will have to backtrack to account for the next word which is coming. We will have to backtrack many, many words behind and we will have to come back and stop at raised, raised. The sentence can paraphrased as the horse which was raised past the garden fell, then there is no problem. So, if we now begin to analyze the sentence, okay, let us not look at the slide anymore. Uh, we uh, begin to analyze the sentence, the horse raced past the garden fell. Here, the other paraphrase of the sentence is the horse which was raised past the garden fell. Now, which was raised past the garden, this is a clause, okay, this is a complete sentence in itself except that it is a relative, it has a relative pronoun, which was raised past the garden fell. So, the core sentence is the horse fell, subject and predicate, subject and verb, the horse fell, which horse? The horse which was raised past the garden, 
Okay. So, raced past the garden is the clause is the modifier for horse. Now, English has this uh, has this peculiarity that in the past tense and under certain conditions it can have what is called an elision an elliptic construct. Okay. Let me write it down it can have an elision. Elision okay, or eliding. Eliding means cutting out or dropping. Okay. So, the sentence had a relative pronoun the horse which was raced past the garden fell, this which was can be dropped. The condition is that in the past tense a relative clause for a noun in the past tense a relative clause for a noun can drop the relative pronoun and the verb okay the auxiliary verb if that noun is an object and the verb is in past tense okay these are the two conditions the relative pronoun along with the auxiliary can be elided or dropped if the noun is an object and the tense of the verb is past. So, here also you can see the horse was raised past the garden. So, the horse is the object somebody raised the horse. So, horse is the object and uh, the, the activity which is racing it is in the past tense and therefore, which was can be dropped. Therefore, the horse raised past the garden fell is a completely grammatical sentence except that the parsing process will move on go up to garden think that the sentence is finished encounter fall fell and it will have to do the backtracking to discover that race past the garden is actually a modifier for horse with elision of relative pronoun and the auxiliary. Okay. So, this is an example of a very interesting phenomenon which is a challenge for parsing. The phenomenon is that the sentence seems to get over, but there is an additional textual matter, matter which demands that the whole parsing process redo its work, go back to a particular point, which point it is, how to find out that particular point is a complex problem and therefore, these sentences are a big headache for the parsing process. These sentences are known as garden path sentences presumably from this example, this particular example okay, which mentions the word garden. Another theory is that uh, these sentences seem to lead you, okay, lead the reader of the sentence or the lead the lead the parser of the sentence along a garden path from where the parsing machinery will have to backtrack. Okay. This is the meaning. So, garden pathing is a very important challenge for all parsing algorithms. Whenever we design a new parsing algorithm, those parsing algorithms are tested against garden path sentences to find out how efficient their processing is. The next sentence also is a garden pathing phenomenon. If you look at the slide, the old man the boat. This is an interesting sentence, because here the garden pathing is on the phrase. The old man and the reader's expectation is that this whole thing is a noun phrase the old man and then he or she is in for a surprise, because the old man the boat the whole sentence does not seem to have a verb. Okay. The whole sentence seems to be without a verb and therefore, an ungrammatical sentence. Sentence The verb seems to have disappeared. Again, we have to do backtracking and we have to consider other possibilities. Okay. So, uh, let us consider the sentence once again, the old man the boat. The old man can be a noun phrase. What are the other possibilities? Man, the word man can be a verb one meaning of man is man as a noun, 
the other meaning of man is maneuver okay steer we can man a ship okay and this would mean that we are steering a ship the old man the boat would mean old persons okay old persons now again a peculiarity of english is that one can use the adjectives as nouns the old means the old people the old man the boat means the old people maneuver or steer the boat that is the meaning of the sentence now in this case what will happen is that we will think that the sentence is ungrammatical because there is no verb here having come here if you look at the slide the old man the boat having come here after man we expect a verb we do not find a verb here so we backtrack and see what are the alternate possibilities the other possibility is that the word man itself is a verb in which case the old will be the noun phrase man is the verb and the boat is the object so subject the old man the verb and the board the object so subject verb object everything perfectly okay okay so the sentence is grammatical and this is found out found out by backtracking from before the point the okay so this backtracking goes goes back and says that man is the verb so this is a garden pathing phenomenon just like before except that in this case the a garden path thing is happening because of uh, the multiple part of speech of man. Finally, the last sentence twin bomb strike in Baghdad kill 25. This is not a, a garden path thing sentence per se, but this happens in the newspaper context. In the newspaper one is used to seeing headlines where the words are dropped headlines with dropped verbs. So, twin bomb strike in Baghdad that would have finished the news item okay? twin bomb strike in Baghdad. Then we see kill 25 we know that this is not an not a normal uh, normal newspaper heading twin bomb strike in Baghdad. Instead the heading is a complete sentence twin bomb strike in Baghdad kill 25 and the normal procedure of processing a sentence proceeds. Okay. So, the problem he here is the following what I am trying to say is this that the third sentence is not a garden path sentence. Okay. A typical garden pathing sentence is not of that kind. What is happening is that we are in a particular frame of mind when we are reading a newspaper. So, we finish processing at twin bomb strike in Baghdad we finish processing here twin bomb strike in Baghdad finish processing here. After finishing we encounter more text and, and then we revise our opinion about the sentence we revise the processing uh, situation and then proceed with the other possibilities. Okay. So, this is the crux of matter in all garden pathing something is finished some processing is finished there is more material to be processed and therefore, backtrack and begin reprocessing with alternate possibilities that is the whole crux of matter in garden pathing. Okay. The first sentence is the actual classical garden path sentence, the second sentence and the third sentence are, uh, are situation specific or part of speech specific. Proceed further, we now come to the next stage okay. what, what we have done so far is the processing of structure in the sentence namely syntactic processing or parsing. We now move on to a much deeper problem the deeper problem of semantics okay, which is a much more complex task. In fact, in natural language processing a lot of progress has happened on syntactic analysis and parsing. There are extremely sophisticated and very good parsing algorithms but natural language processing researchers have miles to go have to really cover a long distance before making inroads into the fine points of semantic processing. So, this slide says all these things semantic analysis 
the analysis semantic analysis of sentence produces the knowledge representation of the sentence in the form of one of these schemes. The representation of knowledge can be in terms of predicate calculus or semantic nets or frames or conceptual dependencies and scripts. All of these are classical extremely well known knowledge representation schemes. Predicate calculus is a branch of logic a very classical field of knowledge representation, which is fundamental to any kind of inferencing work. Semantic net is concerned with a representation of knowledge in the form of graphs, where we have nodes and arcs capturing relationship between concepts. So, semantic nets, these are semantic graphs. Frames are structured knowledge representation schemes in the form of slots and fillers, okay, where you have a table like structure with different slots and their fillers. Conceptual dependencies are representation of knowledge in the form of primitive constructs and scripts capture stereotypical situations. For example, going to a lecture would mean coming out from the hostel, coming out from home, carrying one's pen, paper, geometry box etcetera, walking the road or taking a vehicle and reaching the class, listening to a lecturer, taking notes, writing an examination. All these are routine activities uh, connected with attending a lecture. So, such things are called scripts. We will cover knowledge representation in some amount of de detail eventually. So, semantic analysis is concerned with representation of a sentence in terms of one or more, sometimes it is more of these knowledge representation schemes. So, I take an example here John gave a book to Mary. Here, there is a give action, okay? a giving action is taking place who is giving? John is giving. So, John is the agent as shown here agent. What is he giving? He is giving a book that is the object. To whom is he giving the book? Mary. So, Mary is the recipient. Therefore, this give action has three entities essential entities without which the give action is not complete. Okay. Give action requires an agent namely John here requires an object namely the book here and it requires a beneficiary of the action namely Mary here the person who is receiving the object of giving. So, this is an important uh, illustration in the sense that it shows what is obtained as a result of knowledge extraction from a sentence. John gave a book to Mary is a sentence from here a structure that we have obtained is give as the main verb having an agent as John having book as the object and having the recipient as Mary. Okay. So, this then finishes the story about John giving a book to Mary. Now, this kind of semantic extraction is very, very crucial to natural language processing. Given a sentence, if we do not understand what the semantics of this whole sentence is, then any further processing is impossible. So, that kind of processing happens by means of what is called semantic roles. Okay. So, semantic roles capture the relationship of nouns present in a sentence with the main verb of the sentence, the main action of the sentence. So, John gave a book to Mary, here the action is give action, the nouns are John, book and Mary and semantic roles are agent, object and recipient respectively. So, these things agent, object, recipient these are known as semantic roles, they capture the relationship of the nouns present in the sentence with the verb of the sentence. Now, when we capture the 
uh, semantics of a sentence unambiguously, precisely, correctly, then the semantic roles have become very clear for the sentence. So, to obtain the meaning of a sentence, the semantic roles have to be identified without any mistake. I make this point to show that if the semantic role is not correctly identified, then it can lead to distortion of meaning and there are kinds of ambiguity which arise from the ambiguity of semantic roles. Look at this sentence here in the slide. Ambiguity in semantic role labeling. We have an English sentence here. Visiting aunts can be a nuisance. It is a very well known classical sentence in natural language processing, which illustrates the ambiguity of semantic roles. What can one make out from the sentence here? Visiting aunts can be a nuisance. One meaning is aunts who are visiting, aunts who are coming to see us can be a nuisance. Okay. In this case, the action is visit, who is performing the action? Aunts. So, aunts are the agents of visiting. Okay. The other reading of this sentence is visiting aunts can be a nuisance where aunts are objects of visiting. So, I am called upon to visit my aunt okay, and I am not happy about this. So, in this case, the visitor is I the agent of visiting is I and the object of visiting is aunt. So, if you contrast these with the previous sense of the sentence, uh, there the visitor was aunt. So, aunt is the agent in the next meaning aunt is the object. Okay. So, this particular sentence has left the ambiguity of semantic role labeling unresolved. From the sentence one cannot make out what is the semantic role of aunt. Is aunt the agent of visiting or is aunt the object of visiting? Again here I insist that you translate the sentence into your own mother tongue and you will see that unless you commit to a particular semantic role the sentence cannot be translated unambiguously. You have to leave both the meanings open. Okay. So, one uh, for example, if we take Hindi, Mausi ke pas jana. In this case, I am visiting the aunts. So, main Mausi ke pas jara. The other meaning is Mausi ka hamare iha ana visiting aunts okay aunts who are visiting us so in this case it is ane wali mausi okay so hum mausi ke paas ja rahe ya mausi hamare paas aa rahe depending on that the semantic role of aunt is changing and this is making the sentence english sentence ambiguous the hindi sentence or for that matter any Indian language sentence I believe will not be ambiguous or in other words the sentence when translated will have to commit to semantic role disambiguation. We take an example just below it which is an Hindi example. Aapko mujhe mithai khilani padegi. Aapko mujhe mithai khilani padegi. This particular sentence is ambiguous again because of semantic role. Okay. What is the action here? The action here is khilana okay, or to give. So, here what is happening is that a giving action is taking place or a feeding action is taking place which is the action of khilana. Now, there is no ambiguity with respect to object. What is being given or what is being fed is very clear it is mithai sweets. The problem comes in who is giving sweets to whom. 
आपको मुझे मिठाई खिलानी पड़ेगी यू विल हैव टू लुक एट मी नाउ बिकॉज आई हैव टू परफॉर्म दैट एक्शन आपको मुझे मुझे मिठाई खिलानी पड़ेगी आई विल ईट द स्वीट्स सो इन दिस केस यू आर गिविंग मी द स्वीट्स सो आई एम द बेनिफिशियरी ऑफ गिव एक्शन आई एम द रेसिपेंट द ऑब्जेक्ट इज क्लियर द ऑब्जेक्ट इज मिठाई ओके देर इज एम्बिग्यूथ विथ रेस्पेक्ट टू एजेंट एंड बेनिफिशियरी वेन आई एम द बेनिफिशियरी मुझे मिठाई खिलानी पड़ेगी आई गेट द स्वीट्स आपको यू हैव टू गिव स्वीट्स टू मी द अदर रीडिंग रीडिंग इज आपको मुझे मिठाई खिलानी पड़ेगी मैं आपको मिठाई खिलाऊंगा ओके आई विल गिव स्वीट्स टू यू द अदर रीडिंग वॉज यू विल गिव स्वीट्स टू मी सो देर इज ए सेमांटिक रोल रिवर्सल बिटवीन मी एंड यू इन टर्म्स ऑफ एजेंट एंड बेनिफिशियरी so indo european languages which are close to hindi like marathi and bengali they retain this ambiguity okay in bengali we have to say apnake amay mishti khawate hobe so this sentence is ambiguous because it doesn't specify who is giving sweets to whom this is um, this sentence is ambiguous in marathi also but it is not ambiguous in dravidian languages where you have to produce the sentence after resolving semantic role because that will decide the case markers and other suffix information on the nouns okay the semantic role will have to be disambiguated just like visiting aunts can be nuisance is an ambiguous sentence in english but when we take it to an indian language sentence we have to commit to the semantic role and the ambiguity has to be resolved proceeding further we come to pragmatics so what we saw was semantic role labeling which is <coughs> processing of semantics when you come to pragmatics we are concerned with how a sentence is processed by a user when a speaker utters a sentence when a listener listens to that sentence okay an information giver and an information recipient how they look at the sentence so this is a very very hard problem known to be a very very hard problem in natural language processing we look at the transparency here and see an example of pragmatics being important pragmatics is concerned with modeling user intention so see here uh, i have a piece of conversation there is a tourist who is in a hurry the tourist is checking out of the hotel and he is motioning to the service boy ishara kar rahe to the service boy boy go upstairs and see if my sandals are under the divan do not be late i just have 15 minutes to catch the train the boy running upstairs and coming back panting yes sir they are there okay so the boy is answering the tourist question appropriately there is no problem about that so he is saying that the sandal is under the divan but the tourist intention was to get that sandal and he was already late for the train and therefore this sandal had to be brought to him but the sentence uh his his sentence only specified to the boy that he should go and see if the sandal is under the divan there was no specific instruction with respect to the boy's getting the sandal and giving it to him okay so that was the crux of the problem human beings have no problem with this kind of situation they are extremely good at dealing with the pragmatics of the sentence okay so when a sentence is uttered we understand the intention behind that sentence we also understand who is the recipient of the sentence okay now in this tourist boy conversation it was actually an instruction for the boy to bring the sandal though the sentence did not say it in explicit terms 
the intention was that okay and therefore the uh, the stage of pragmatics for natural language processing is concerned with modeling the user intention which is a very very hard problem to uh, illustrate what i mean by this let me give you another example many times we sit on the dining table and we point to the neighbor is that water okay you ask the neighbor is that water okay point to a jug and say is that water the intention actually is for you to obtain that jug of water you would like to drink some water so when you ask your neighbor is that water this is not actually a question it is actually a request in the form of a question the request is please pass me that jug of water and if the neighbor just says yes or no is that water yes it is water and then does nothing about it then the there is a pragmatics failure there is no syntax semantics or lexical processing failure there is pragmatics failure we there's the, the the neighbor in the dining table has not understood the intention behind the question notice that the same sentence is all right in a chemistry lab situation okay so it is possible that an examiner comes to a student performing a practical examination and points to water and says is that water okay the examiner presumably doesn't have any intention of drinking the water but he is examining the student with respect to what that particular compound is okay so in a chemistry lab situation pragmatics again is ensuring that this question is actually a question in the dining table situation this question was not a question it was actually a request so pragmatics is extremely situation specific uh, there is some kind of pragmatics playing a role in this sentence why india needs a second october times of india second uh, october 2007 this particular sentence will not be understand very will not be understood very easily by a non indian that a person reading this sentence will have to understand the significance of second october which is the birth anniversary of mahatma gandhi second october has a special significance for any indian this is the birth anniversary of mahatma gandhi we celebrate second october with different kinds of uh, with pujas bhajans and songs and so on so why india needs a second october will be wrongly interpreted or completely not understood by a person who doesn't understand the meaning of second october the special significance of second october so this again is a pragmatic consideration it shows the importance of pragmatics where a special world knowledge or situation knowledge is helping the user speaker listener to understand a sentence okay so this is the scope of pragmatics pragmatics is a very hard problem mainly because it has to do user modeling it has to know users preferences likes dislikes pragmatics also has to know situation specific constructs and their significances okay now we move on to the last stage of processing presumably the, a very very difficult stage once again like pragmatics this is the uh, stage of discourse processing discourse processing is concerned with processing of sequence of sentences so far we have been discussing only one sentence okay a a sentence which is demarcated by two full stops on two sides in this case now in discourse we are concerned with sequence of sentences i take here a piece of conversation mother to john john go to school it is open today should you bunk father will be very angry so these four 
pieces of text are uttered by a mother and the listener is a boy called John. Now, when we look at these, uh, these four sentences, one of which is interrogative, we cannot but be astonished at the ease with which we process these sentences, because there are many, many complex tasks involved here. The first challenge to process these sentences is the ambiguity of open. Open is a very, very polysemous verb, a verb with many, many different meanings. And in this case, we are concerned with that particular meaning of open, which says the school is working, the school is open today. It is not that the school's doors and windows are open, the school is working. It is open to the means the school is working today. So, there is ambiguity of open and we have resolved this ambiguity by taking the particular meaning of open which is working. The next challenging problem here is ellipsis. We mentioned before that uh, in garden path sentences, uh, the difficulty of processing comes, one kind of difficulty of processing comes because of elision. The relative pronoun and the auxiliary verb has dropped and therefore, uh, there is a difficulty in parsing. Now, when we consider these sentences here, the school is open today and uh, should you bunk is the next sentence, which the mother utters for John, should you bunk. The question is, how does John know what is the object of bunking? Bunk is a verb. Should you bunk what? So, should you bunk the school naturally? The school as a piece of text is coming from one of the previous sentences. Which sentence? The sentence is the first sentence. John go to school. It is open today. It is a pronoun which refers to the noun here this kind of pronoun to noun referencing is called anaphora okay? and a big branch of natural language processing is concerned with anaphora resolution. How do you correctly bind a pronoun with a particular noun? The next problem that we are trying to resolve here is the problem of ellipsis. Should you bunk? Should you bunk means should you bunk the school and the piece of text the school came from a previous sentence, not the immediately preceding sentence, but the sentence before that. Okay? And you can presumably see that these kind of ellipse handling may require obtaining textual, materi uh, textual material from a very distant sentence, maybe five or six sentences away. You have to pick up the textual matter, matter from there. Therefore, ellipsis handling is a difficult problem this is the challenge. Now, we come to the last sentence father will be very angry. Question is why will the father be angry and it is amazing how our mind processes this sentence. There is a complex chain of reasoning and application of world knowledge here. The father is angry because the son is disobedient, John is disobedient or he is angry because he is apprehensive about John not going to the school and forming a bad habit and thereby uh, entering the possibility of a bleak future. Okay? All this complex chain of reasoning comes to the father's mind and he becomes angry. Uh, again, we can see that we have applied word knowledge namely the fact that discipline is important in our life, we have to attend the school regularly, we should have good habits, this is world knowledge and we are also resolving the ambiguity of father. This ambiguity is a very interesting ambiguity. One ambiguity point is that the father is um, John's father. When we say father will be angry, it could be somebody else's father also, Jack's father. Okay. But from the context, it is clear that the father that is being referred to is actually John's father. 
Okay. The other ambiguity consideration is that father itself is ambiguous. It can mean either the principal of the school or parent. So, John's father would be John's parent and the school's father is the principal of the school. And we also notice that uh, somebody else's father will not be angry, which is why we can sort of be certain that the father re being referred to here is John's father. It could also vary without any problem, it could also be the principal of the school, father will be very angry, that possibility also remains. Okay. So, the mind will operate with two hypotheses, one is John's father and the other is the school's principal, the school's father. Okay. And since the mother is saying this to John, there is some kind of proximity consideration, mother presumably is referring to John's father, okay, because he is the person who is closest at hand and therefore, it possibly means John's father, but we cannot rule out the possibility of the principal of the school being angry. So, in summary what have I illustrated through this text? Uh, you can listen to me uh, and not look at the slide. Uh, this means that when we process connected sentences, discourse sentences, uh, we keep the knowledge of previous sentences in mind. We also try to predict okay, what sentences are coming in the future and the complex interaction of all these finally, produces the meaning in our mind. And on the way, we solve many problems, the problem of ambiguity of words, multiple meanings of words. We solve the problem of ellipsis, dropping of text or text which is not mentioned. We solve the problem of ambiguity of word, lexical ambiguity, words having multiple meanings. Then, the complex reasoning process to finally, arrive at the meaning. So, all these goes on in our mind and it is indeed a remarkable fact that we can process discourse at all. Okay. We can process a number of sentences together by solving all these little difficulties on the way. Moving further, here is a very interesting example, look at the slide, the complexity of connected text. This was pointed to me by a student of mine from an actual web example. Look at this sentence here, the John was returning from school dejected, today was the math test. Anybody looking at the sentence when asked, what do you think about John, who is John? So, the reader or the hearer of the sentence would uh, in all probability say that John is a student in the school. John was returning from school dejected, today was the math test. He probably could not do well in the math test. Next sentence, he could not control the class. So, after seeing the first, first sentence, our hypothesis about John was, John is a student of the school. When we encountered this sentence now, he could not control the class and therefore, he was dejected. Our hypothesis, the previous hypothesis actually does not bear up to this new evidence. Who controls the class? The teacher controls the class and since John is returning dejected from the school and he could not control the class, our hypothesis about John is likely to be teacher, John is a teacher. So, the previous sentence showed, uh, previous sentence sort of led to the surmise that John is a student, the next sentence is saying John is possibly a teacher. Next sentence on the slide, teacher should not have made him responsible, see here we have come back to the student hypothesis about John, teacher should not have made him responsible whom does the teacher make responsible? It is a special student in the class called the monitor, okay, the head boy of the class. 
So, we are now back to John being a student albeit a special kind of student namely monitor or the head boy. Finally, we encounter this sentence after all he is just a janitor. So, this says that John was returning school returning from the school dejected. Today was the math test makes John a student he could not control the class makes John a teacher. Teacher should not have made him responsible makes John a monitor and uh, then he uh, finally, when we encounter the sentence after all he is just a jan janitor that overthrows all hypothesis about John neither teacher nor student nor monitor he is a janitor who cleans the classrooms, sweeps the floors and so on. So, this is a very very instructive example which shows that in natural language processing for every new piece of data we weigh the hypothesis formed so far in our mind against the sentences which are arriving. Okay. So, the first sentence made John a student, second sentence made John a teacher, third sentence made John a monitor a special student and the fourth sentence made John a monitor a person who cleans the class. Okay. So, this shows that when we process a set of connected sentences, it becomes a very complex problem. We not only solve word ambiguity, we not only solve anaphoras binding of pronoun to noun, we not only solve ellipses where there are unmentioned text, we also form, uh, we also solve the problem of forming hypothesis and uh, discarding them on the face of new evidence or data. Just look at the last transparency and with that we will close the class. This will be our next topic of discussion where we say that natural language processing has been attempted from two different uh, directions. One is the classical approach to natural language processing which makes use of knowledge and rules and the second approach is statistical machine learning approach to natural language processing, which is the current approach to natural language processing. With that we will close and we will discuss this topic in the next class.